Hello. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Just waiting for Kwabana to come. How's it going, Jen? Okay. You know, day, so. Well, thanks for taking the time to to uh, to 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 be a part of this. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. This is the highlight of my day. So I'm oh. <laughs> good. Um, let me see if I can find. Love enough. Try to set this up so I'm not holding it the whole time. Hello to everyone who's coming in. We're just waiting for our other guests who I've just invited. So hopefully he should be joining us in just a bit. And happy New Year to everybody. Noganians will be wishing each other Happy New Year probably until Easter. <laughs> At the earliest. Ah, thank you, Papa. Thank you, you. Okay. Uh, no sign of Club and I yet. Let me see. I just sent him a quick message. Mm. An ape of me. Let's try that again. Well, while we wait for Kwabana to come, I'll just do a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Kirsty Quartang. I am the um, founder of the Nana Project, which is an online archive that's dedicated to uh, preserving Ghana's history through the voices of Ghanaian elders. We started doing this work in, uh, we started in 2014, launched in 2015, and since then we've been doing our best to to speak with any Ghanaian elder that is willing to to, to talk to us um, about uh, about their lives, about what they remember about different parts of Ghana's history. And I wanted to uh, do this live because uh, since we've started I've had people um, talk to me uh, privately. Oh, there he is. Um, talk to me um, or, or ask if um, we could have um, just some conversations about how um, how they could get started. Sorry, I don't see. Let's see. Okay. Just trying to see if we can get him to join. see is it i don't it prompted me to send a request interesting okay the benefits know. of technology right like i know easier and harder at the same time something we can talk about today some cha cha challenges this is one of the one of the challenges but technology doesn't go the way that we're hoping Quab, now if you can see this um Maybe I know you asked me yesterday if your profile needs to be um, public, and I said no. It looks like maybe I was wrong. So if you don't, mind, if you don't mind, um, just hopping off, making your profile public, and then coming back um, because it's, it's showing that you're still unable to join. So let's give that a try, um, and hopefully that will um, allow you to join. I hope he, I hope you saw that. I'm going to send him, send him a message. Let me. I'm going to put on some music where we get this sorted out. 
Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone that is joining, thank you for joining us. Just having some slight technical challenges as we tend to do with these things. Okay, okay. So, okay. There we go. Yay! Uh -huh. Pavana, hi. Sorry, Pavana, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no problem. <laughs> Uh, is my screen clear? It's, it's a, a little, little, it's fuzzy. Yeah. Okay, let me try and wipe it or something. My phone has been a bit. Let's see. You know, when I told you that you don't have to be um, private, I just remembered that I, I did uh, the live I did, I did it with my sister, and we did it from her Instagram account in public. So that's why I was able to do it. <laughs> there we go. We can see you now. Wonderful. Fantastic. Wonderful. Yeah. Great, great, great. Thank so you. let me, so I'll, I'll start over then from the beginning. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for joining Hi, us. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Nana. <laughs> Thank you for um, joining us. Thank you for bearing with us with the, through the technical issue. Um, my name, like I said, my name is Kirsty Partang. I am the founder of the Nana Project. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with what we do, we are an online platform that is dedicated to preserving Ghanaian history through the voices of Ghanaian elders. And so we're all about oral history interviewing. That's what we do. And that's what we're here to, uh, to talk about today. And for those of you that missed, I said that I wanted to do this IG Live um, because since we started the NANA Project back in 2014, 2015, um, people have approached me privately asking for information on how they can do the work that we do within their own families what they can do, how they can learn to um, become their own family historians. And so I actually most recently did this in November. And after talking with my friend about this, I was like, I'm sure there are other people that want to know how to do this. So that's what we're here to discuss today. And I'm very happy to have people that I consider to be experts in this area, Jennifer Hart and Kwabana Okoku Ajima. And before we get started, I will oh, just give them both um, some time to introduce themselves and in their work. So, who, Go ahead, Kwabana. <laughs> ha, she put me on the spot. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, good evening from Accra. Um, I'm Dr. Kwabana Okoku Ajima, and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana's Department of English. Um, I'm interested in digital humanities, digital mm -hmm. literature, and stuff like that. And my research is on different African literature type things and digital humanities and stuff as well. Um, I'm very interested in mentoring young people and I enjoy um, working with students in different contexts. And I actually did a class on oral histories. Uh, we did an oral history project somewhere in there. So I'll be excited to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and I'm I'm uh, honored to be here uh, with two of my dear friends and compatriots in Ghana history and digital humanities work. Um, so I'm Jennifer Hart. I'm a historian and um, coming to you from Detroit, Michigan, uh, as you might indicate or as it's indicated in my um, Instagram handle, right uh, at Detroit to Accra. I, I kind of move between um, these cities and they, they um, play a really important role in, in my scholarship and my life. Um, I am a historian and an anthropologist, and I have conducted oral histories in Ghana um, and done various kinds of ethnographic and archival research um, over the course of about 20 years. And, um, you know, out of that comes a lot of experience in Indian people. My first book is called Ghana on the Go and um, included interviews with hundreds of uh, drivers and passengers around Ghana. And um, the work I'm doing now also, you know, draws on people's um, lived experience in lots of ways. Um, and I work on also on a digital humanities project that um, we're hoping to debut this summer. So um, you'll hopefully be able to access that where you can upload your own oral histories too about your experiences in mobility and life in Accra. 
Uh, just quickly before Christy comes in, Ghana on the Go is a very good book. Look for it if you can. Thank you. <laughs> You're very kind. Wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and just jump into the conversation. Um, I do want to say, uh, since this um, our this work does center Ghana, um, the conversation will be centering the Ghanaian cultural context and perspective. So if you aren't Ghanaian, uh, thank you for joining. You are most welcome here. Um, you, there might be some things that you find aren't um, necessarily um, applicable to your own cultural context. And I think that's, that's okay. Um, you can take uh, whatever you feel will work for you and your community. And, and if you um, see something that you feel might not work directly, but if you, you know, you can adapt it. So it, um, so it fits your own cultural, cultural context. And let me see if I can, I think I'll start. If you have questions, I prefer people use, let's see. Is there a way to, okay. Yeah, there's a question. Okay, yeah. Thing. Yeah, I would if you have yeah. questions, use the like the the question function versus putting them in the chat that way they don't get lost. Um yeah. so so to begin, when I've had these conversations with people about how they can get started, um the um the first issue that they have is that they just generally have no idea where they feel very overwhelmed. They don't know where to start. They don't know how to begin. So some like some things that I do with them, I ask them, well, okay, first of all, what are you trying to learn about your family? Like, what are there specific things that you want to know about your family history, gen family history generally? Or is there a specific person that you want to know their life story? Like, do you want to speak to your grandmother about her life? Or are you trying to find information about your great grandmother from your grandmother? you know things like things like that I and mean, then i also suggest that they kind of familiarize themselves with the historical period that they're interested in looking at so let's say if their grandmother was born in 19 1940 and their grandmother was you know born in takarati okay so google is our friend you can do some small small research to see just you know okay what was going on in takarati 1940s just so you have an idea of um, the time that, you know, your grandmother was, was growing up in. And I also suggest that they try to find any tangible history they, that they have at their house or their grandparents' house or wherever. That can be, like, old mementos. It can be old photos or even the... Um, the Ghani and the, the funeral um, pamphlets <laughs> that, they, that they give for those of you that aren't familiar. Um, Ghani and funerals, when someone passes, they, the family normally makes um, a, like a brochure of the person and their life. It has their um, a full autobiography, as well as, you know, lots of photos um, and tributes from their you know, family, friends, co-workers, anyone that knew them that wanted to pay um, homage to them. So that's kind of where I encourage people to start. But so for the two of you, um, how would you, if someone came to you and said, I'm interested in viewing, interviewing an elder in my family, how can I begin? And then also in your own work, like how do you, how do you begin if you need to find people to interview for a project? Like how do you, how do you start? Kwabana, we can start with you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would advise that the first thing to think about is not to think of oral history as inferior to written history. The, the perception that we have a lot of, you know, and for me it's problematic because, I mean, on the one hand, all written history comes from oral sources, right? And on the other hand, the fact that someone says something doesn't mean that what they are saying is not wrong. And actually, oral history is be the most crucial or critical way of understanding the people, their place, whatever they are looking for. So we have to privilege the status of oral history. That's the first thing that I sort of usually go into. And then I try to help them understand that documentation isn't all necessarily written down. Mm -hmm. Something that is performed, that is practiced, that is acted, right? So once you reconceptualize history in that way, then it's easy to see your oral or your oral history source as something that is actually very legitimate and very helpful. Then the final thing I'll say before I uh, see the note to Jennifer is to understand that orality is actually very universal. You know, when, and you know, the average Ghanaian 
will typically defer to the Bible, right? And the Bible is from oral sources. Like the, I mean, it's generally agreed that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And mm -hmm. all the histories from his people that he simply wrote down later on. And I'm a literature person, so we think about um, the Odyssey and the Iliad. Mm -hmm. they, Homer wrote them, but Homer didn't write them. They were songs that were sung by people for... He was just one of the best singers of those songs. So then they attributed them to him. So they were not written down initially. They were all spoken. They were all recounted. They were all oral. So when you have an older person in your family or a source like that, that person is actually very valuable. And if that person dies without seeing what they have, that's like a library burning. Yep. You know? Yes. So all these older people floating around, they are actually gold mines for a lot of very important history. And you hear personal stories of things that we've seen written down, and we realize how limited our written history is. You know. So for me, I think that one of the most important things you need to do is to privilege oral history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all really great points. And um, I think, you know, I just want to like emphasize some of them or, or maybe kind of um, think about them a little bit differently. Um, and, and so one of them, uh, the, one of the big things that Kwabana was saying um, that I think is really important is that is the importance of orality, right? And, and, the, and it's equal weight with written history. Um, all sources have perspectives. Often we're taught that just because something's written down, that means it's true. That's not the case, right? Just because something's in an archive doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's neutral. It doesn't mean it's objective. There's actually no such thing as objectivity. Everything is produced. Everything that's produced by a human being is produced with some sort of subjective perspective, right? And so when we do oral histories, we're not looking for the truth. Um, when we do research, we're not looking for the truth. We're trying to understand somebody's experience, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to understand exactly. their perspective. So there's some things that we know happened, but how people interpret those things, what they mean, that's the work of history, right? That's really what's interesting about historical stories, not just the events themselves that you memorize, right? Like facts and dates you might have to memorize in school, right? That's not really what like historians are really interested in, what history is really about. That's the, the, the really interesting part of historical stories is the stuff about what these things mean to people, right? And what the, what the consequences are. And so, um, when uh, when you're when you're doing oral histories, one of the most important things that I talk to people about is how you don't need to go in assuming anything, yeah. right? Um, you need to start with the foundation that you don't know and you just want to learn, mm -hmm. which means that you listen, right? Um, and so I often start off um, not necessarily with um, you know you if you have a specific theme that you want to ask people about or something, then it's helpful to have a specific set of questions. If you're doing like a research project, for example. Um, but I also like to be really open about the way that I approach oral history interviews and start with just asking people to tell me about themselves, right? Really basic stories. So when I was writing Ghana on the go, I was interviewing a lot of older drivers. Um, and so I would just start out by asking them to tell me when they like when they started driving. So, you know, who are you? Where are you from? When did you become a driver? What inspired you to become a driver? Right. Um, and they would start telling me that. And then I would ask questions from there. Right. Um, but it's, you know, creating that open um, that sense of openness where you're not assuming anything or projecting any agenda onto the conversation, but you're letting people tell the story they want to tell. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Um, the other thing that I think is really important um, and that I think about all the time, because when I tried to, I, so I wanted to interview my own grandmother, right? Um, and my grandmother um, was from a very poor family and from a rural area and she always thought that her story didn't matter she'd grown up not being treated very well and not being respected very much um even well into her adulthood right and so she didn't have a sense of her own story and she wasn't one to like be an active storyteller so you would have to really like encourage her and engage her um and 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 make her feel respected to get her to tell a story right mm -hmm. um that didn't mean her story was not important. So that's the other thing I wanted to say. 
when you're going to when you're looking for somebody to interview don't assume that the person who is the most important or the most senior or the wealthiest or the head of the family or whatever is the person who's the most like important or relevant or interesting to interview um sometimes those people are um but not always right and right. a lot of other people might be super interesting too um they just might need a little encouragement to tell their own story and so um you know showing people respect when you go in and being open to listening right is is a way that you encourage people to tell their own story right um mm -hmm. listening rather than than trying to direct what they're saying that's really important yeah the right off the bat y'all are hitting it the final yes really really great points and i want to just touch on um the point Kwabana said about when a like old person passes a library dies it, it was actually the or, or library burns that's actually the the death of my maternal grandmother that started that, that planted the seed of the nana project um within me um she passed away in 2007 she was 96 and that year was the year that um ghana turned 50 and so i'm like okay doing math so if she was 96 Ghana, you know, in this year, 50 years ago, she would have been 40, 46. So a full adult with children, you know, um, oh, you know, it was almost half of her life, um, Ghana was colonized. And for the second half, it was not. So I was just thinking like, wow, my grandmother knew, like she knew so much. And like, it's all, all that information that she carried in her was gone because nobody sought to ask her about her life. And so as a way to kind of prevent that from happening again um you know i, I started the, the the nana project it didn't happen right um right away but um it it you know it, it it did happen and i'm really glad to that that this the the nana project and other projects like it, the work that you you both are doing uh, exist to try to you know pr you know save our save our libraries pretty much um, yeah for sure yeah. i don't know if anybody's ever read otto Koisen's oxford street Accra, but he makes a similar point at the beginning of that book um, where he's talking about, you know, sources to, to understand the history of Accra and how there's not a lot of great sources, but that people, um, people were really the most important source. And, and that's, that's very true. You know, and I know like for, for Ghana on the go, you know, almost all of the people I was interviewing very old drivers and almost all the people that I interviewed, that book was published in 2016. Um, almost all the people that I interviewed are now dead. Ooh. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, so it's, uh, you know, the people who had who had these experiences, even people who were born in the 50s and 60s now are are reaching an older age. Right. And are, yeah. are at various kinds of risk. And so we, um, you know, the part of it is is a, like, you know, we should respect other people's stories and learn about them because that's how we all grow and learn is by appreciating other humans. Right. We grow in our human experience by appreciating the stories of other humans, but also um, you know, it's it's also about pre preserving history. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I mean, you think about all the information that we are losing by all these people and the implications of that in how we tend to now think about ourselves, our culture. Talk about like, it's so like self-defeating. And you hear of people like looking down on themselves and saying all kinds of things, something as if we never had anything and so on and so forth, you know, like, I mean, I uh, I took a tour of Accra with, and actually he's also dead now. So the former mayor of Accra, not Amadi, and he was telling us about how there was apartheid in Accra. And I had no idea, you know. So if you know Accra, the ridge roundabout area, um, if you move from the ridge roundabout to Adabraka, there's the Holy Spirit Cathedral, and that used to be a no man's land. So it was a border between the Europeans and the Africans, and the Africans could not go in, um, into the rich area, cantonments, so on and so forth. And you can tell from even how the architecture of the places and the neem trees that were planted there. So they allowed neem trees to be planted only where the Europeans were because they felt it would prevent malaria. And they didn't want neem trees where the Africans were, you know. And then you think, but I, I mean, so like there's so much history all around us. And it's so rich and yet we don't seem to sort of think about it you know yeah i think especially for people you know like my uh, one of the one of the things that um one of the connections that i often see between my work in ghana and and the work 
of people about the history of Detroit and, and about the history of my own family are, are people who are often left out of the archives, right? Exactly. Um, often, you know, these oral histories are the only sources that we have about people's experiences of the past because the nature of politics, right? The exactly. nature of power meant that the people who were in power weren't listening to the people mm -hmm. who's, who were poor or who mm -hmm. were, were mm -hmm. black or who were, yeah. you know, yeah. um, whatever. And right. um, so that's all we have. And so it's, it is really important to capture those experiences so that we can understand right in this moment where we're thinking about all these structural inequalities mm -hmm. and trying to challenge like, you know, and, and do the work of decolonization. It's so important. Exactly. That we listen to these experiences. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 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 did you want to? Did you want to add something? Because I had no. A... I mean, I was just agreeing with Jennifer. Okay. Okay. So, uh, an another thing that would come up often, I think Jennifer, you touched on it a little bit, are like the the when people misremember, you know, history, or if they get you know dates wrong, or I know in one interview, um, someone said they were. They were talking about being a part of the the young young pioneer movement, which for those of you that are not familiar, that was like the like a, a youth core that was a part of the um, convention people's party that Kwame uh, was the head of. But instead of calling it um, the young pioneer movement, she called it like the, the young people's brigade or so something to that effect. But but the things that she, she was saying were correct. So what do people do? If they're speaking with someone because you know you people the people that we're speaking with are elderly it's gonna be a lot to ask them to remember something that happened <laughs> like 50 years 50 years ago right. um so and so what what can we do if we're um speaking with with people and some of the things that they saying are saying aren't um what we would call factually correct I, I mean, I think that your, some of your advice at the beginning is really helpful. So, so knowing some stuff is uh, about the period is really helpful so that when people say stuff, you don't have to tell them they're wrong, right? You can say, oh, did you mean the Young Pioneers movement? Um, or I heard it referred to the Young Pioneers, the Young Pioneers. Is that the same? Um, right? You can say stuff like that. It doesn't, it's not challenging them, right? It's, it's making sure that you understand the same thing that they're talking about. Often people really appreciate that. Um, and they'll say, yes, yes, right? Um, that's it. And the, the other thing is, is having, um, having stuff available that you can have people look at. So whether that's old newspaper articles, whether that's old photographs, whether that's whatever, right? Often that helps trigger people I mean, it's something they can directly connect to. So, um, you know, if you have something that's related to that or that you think is related to that, you can put it in front of them and be like, Gee, is this what you're talking about? Right? And um, and that can be helpful as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I'm agreeing with both of you. Like, you don't just go in there with no knowledge at all. Like, take the time to also try and find something. I mean, admittedly, there's not a lot of information on the continent online and elsewhere but you still find something like mm -hmm. have a even a small idea is a, is a nice way of entering into a conversation about anything and you never know maybe at the time it was called one thing but then people called it something else colloquially or informally you know mm -hmm. and yet the official um like writers didn't capture that you know so you might find something that came in the history book. And it can help you understand that maybe there were different names, for different, you know. And never know. And in any case, perspective is what matters in all this. There's everything. I mean, people on this live video, everybody will talk about this live differently if they have to talk about it tomorrow. Differently if they talk about it differently if they talk about it. Right. And it doesn't mean anyone is necessarily. It just means that their perspective is shaped by what they saw and their own context and all of that. So for me, it's helpful to keep those in mind when you are talking to people and getting things. But if it's possible to, you can also cross-check with other people. Mm. You know, if you can, if you can, that's But you can talk to other people. And of course, it's, that's a different story altogether. But if you are listening to someone and always ask somebody else and listen to what they say because there's always a perspective, there's always an agenda, regardless. And this is whether the thing being said is controversial or not. Mm. Yeah, you can also always go back, 
right? Uh, you can you can go back later. So if somebody, you know, you talk to somebody and then you, you go back and listen, you do a little research and you try to figure out exactly what they were saying, you can go back and verify with them, right? And maybe that leads you to ask new questions and additional questions that you hadn't thought about before because it, it, led, it led you to learn something <laughs> that you weren't aware of before. Um, so that's also really important. And I think, you know, you know not everybody's going to do this necessarily, but especially in the context of a larger research agenda, um, or if you're doing a like comprehensive family history, you're trying to interview lots of people, right? You might start out with people kind of on the edges, right? Um, so like if I'm thinking about my family, I might start with some of my cousins um, and some of my aunts and uncles before I went to my great aunts and uncles and grandparents, right? Um, because I wanted, I would want to find out some basic information about about like the parameters of their life, like the general like markers and stuff so that when I at, went to ask my grandparents or the older people, um, I would have a little more information, right, to, to help um, make sense of what's going on. So, so you know, if, especially with the people whose time you really value and, and who might um, struggle the most in, in telling their story, having, having prepared, right, can be really helpful. So, so I think that um, answers one of the one of the questions I had around challenges. Because even in the work that we, this work that we do, as great as it is, it, it of course has its own you know set of challenges. And one of them can be you know when people misremember history. But I think there are some others, especially um, in Ghana, which has you know well over eighty languages. You know, language barriers can be an issue sometimes. Um, maybe if you're not able to. Uh, physically travel to the place to um, uh, interview the person in person, which I know it's not a project we like to do if we can, just because it's um, it helps uh, you know just build you know, interpersonal connections. Like in COVID, we weren't able to do that. Um, also, um, is people there might be some subjects that people um, don't want to talk about <laughs> for uh, for whatever reason. Um, they could be things that are within their personal, you know, in their family history, or political history, what have you. Um, how can people, if they encounter challenges like this, like, what, what can they do? Or, or what challenges have to prove you encountered as well um, in your oral history work? That's quite Go important. For it, Bob <laughs> okay. Um, so in answering it, uh, someone sent a question through the chats. But my thing went off again, but so I don't remember the exact question, but it was something along the lines of, what if you hear something in an interview session that shocks you, like how do you react to it and so on and so forth. And I think it's, it's important to understand that it's a privilege to get that kind of information from whoever is speaking. So you have to accord the person a lot of respect. And no matter how shocking or interesting or surprising the, the, the information is, you should be careful not to react in a way that makes the person feel defensive. So you should be very respectful of whoever you're talking to and however you're listening to the person and so on and so forth. Um, that I think is something to always let, like, we should let that guide our interactions with people, especially when they are giving us their time to talk about things. Um, in terms of challenges, I think sometimes it's just um, difficult to uh, find to get information. So for instance, um, for my African literature class, I have my students go around to parts of Accra and find out the oral histories of how the place was founded. So why is Kanishi Kanishi? Why is Medina Medina? What about Adenta, Spintex, um, Nungwa, wherever, you know? And, um, you know, sometimes the people feel like the the students who are coming to ask the questions have some nefarious agenda, right? Or they like they don't know why they're asking for this information, and sometimes they hear conflicting, um, or friend, like conflicting uh, perspectives, you know. And then the question is, how do you synthesize them to get what you think is the truth, you know? But for me, I feel like, and so I'll sort of go back to what Jennifer was saying. Like, it's not necessarily about finding facts, figures, and truth. It's just about finding perspective and then letting those perspectives sort of blend together to form, if it's a complex um, product, that's fine. You know, but for me, even though it's, it's a challenge, I don't think it's too much of a problem when you are hearing different things and so on and so forth. But yeah, one of the biggest challenges I have seen is sometimes the reaction of people when you ask them. 
because maybe they don't understand what you're doing and they don't see why you should be coming for that information. That's one of the things. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of that's really important. I mean, that's all really important. Um, I think one of the things that, um, uh, that Christy was mentioning earlier that I, I really wanted to point out was the idea of, um, subjects that people don't want to talk about. And, um, that's certainly something that's happened to me before. Um, and, and that can happen for different reasons, right? Um, so in some cases you have to understand that, um, you're coming to that interaction with a certain positionality, right? You have a certain role and especially when you're interviewing family members, right? Um, not only are you just in general, a younger person, right? Um, which can impact how older people talk to you and what they're willing to share with you. And maybe you're a woman talking to a man or a man, or a man talking to a woman or whatever. And that can impact things too, right? Gender dynamics. Um, but, uh, but you're also a family member, right? So uh, you're, you're not just younger in age, but, but you have a role in the family and that, that is extra, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, there's definitely times when I would be interviewing older men and there are some things that they would just never tell me. Mm -hmm. about their criminal like you know they might have engaged in some like quasi illegal activity right or like doing drugs or like doing, <laughs> you know like doing stuff that was a little shady and they didn't want to tell me as as a young white woman right um that they had done this stuff they wanted to show themselves as um as like you know these really respectable men and and there's value in that it doesn't mean that what they were telling me was wrong it just meant i wasn't going to be telling the only story Right. Um, that, that I needed to recognize that what the information I was getting was the result of who I was and what I brought to the encounter as much as what those people were telling me. Right. Um, and uh, so so there's that. And I think the other thing that sometimes happens um, <laughs> is is that sometimes we think people aren't telling us something because we're expecting them to tell us. And in reality, by them not saying it, they're actually telling us a lot. Right. Um, so, for example, uh, when I would interview drivers about, um, you know, kind of what hap what their life was like in the 70s and 80s, where, um, you know, we have lots of stories about market women and who loved to talk about their creativity and responding to, um, you know, economic austerity and and um, and drought and um, and other kinds of economic development challenges in that period. Right. Um, I thought for sure, and people assumed also with me that the drivers were going to have similar stories, right? They were going to talk about how things were really hard and they got really creative and they did all this stuff. Um, but, you know, they were, they were persecuted in various ways and they were, you know, we just knew for sure they'd have these really vibrant stories. And I kept asking people, uh, you know, what changed during this period? And they're like, oh, nothing changed. We kept, we continue to make money. And I was like, what? Right. And I just I was I just couldn't understand. I was like, maybe I'm just not asking the question correctly. And so I would ask it a different way or I would come at it from a different angle. And they just kept saying the same thing. And um, so finally, I realized that I needed to take them seriously and think about what that meant. Right. Um, that, that they were telling me something. It wasn't that they were telling that they were telling me something that was incorrect. I was making incorrect assumptions. So sometimes when people aren't telling you something, they actually are telling you something. It's just not what you assume. And, and so sometimes you just have to listen. Um, the other thing about uh, the kind of sensitivity, like um, things that you might be shocked about or, um, or kind of how you react to stuff is, um, is that to keep in mind is that you really have to think from their perspective, not from your own. Right. Uh, so when you're interviewing somebody, you always want to think from their perspective as much as possible. And this is really the work, you know, a, an important thing in, in kind of doing historical research. You have to think about the perspective of a different person from a, in a different time. Right. Um, living a different life. And, um, you know, it might be shocking to you because it's your grandma telling you this. Right? Um, but that doesn't mean it's actually shocking. Right. Um, it might be totally reasonable for a person um, to have done certain things or. Um, you know, I know that there's, um, you know, people in the 1950s and 1960s in, in, in Krima period um, would talk about like informing on relatives, for example, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, or, or informing on neighbors or whatever, right? And, and, you know, that might be shocking to me and hard to understand, I think, for a lot of people. But um, I think, you know, if you think about what it was like to live in that time, right, and the kinds of challenges that people were facing, because um, it wasn't all rosy. Uh, well, a lot of times we 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 um, 
we turn Nkrumah into this like um, hero and, and, and ignore or forget some of the challenges of that period that were real uh, for people living then. Um, that, you know, it, it's easy for us to, uh, to overlook some of this stuff or misinterpret it, right? So, um, you know, can't, can't look back at history with rose tinted glasses and we can't um, want our older relatives to be, um, you know, perfect and, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, uncontroversial or, uh, uh, or kind of squeaky clean all the time. Right. Um, mm -hmm. they were, they're people just like everybody's a person. Nobody's, nobody's, um, you know, all good and all bad. Um, uh, there's, there's all sorts of gray and you have to be willing to accept that. That's what makes people interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I think another challenge is, is there's a difficulty, but it's important to accept the fact that it's not every aspect of history that will be put out there, right? Um, knowledge is power. And sometimes uh, some people don't want aspects of their history to come out, you know, and it happens in other cultures. So in Western countries, for instance, you have special collections in, in the libraries. There's some libraries where you have to seek permission before you take pictures or they won't even allow you to take pictures and why why do some governments classify information because some history is important and they don't want it to go out there and sometimes you can have that on a, on a personal level with some people who don't want to share their histories and it can be frustrating but we have to accept that because they know why they don't want the information to come out and they will not say it you know so sometimes an aspect of family history community history um, an ethnic group, a kingdom, whatever, is not going to be said outside of certain context. And no matter what you do, it won't come out. And it happens in different as well. So, um, so then they'll hear say other things and they, they'll pretend it's fine, they won't say anything about it, but they don't want to say anything about those aspects of the history just because they don't want to. Yeah. And there, I mean, there's a long history in African studies of people trying to figure out ways to infiltrate yeah. those exactly. communities to get the information to make it yeah. known. And I think exactly. I always have a lot of concerns about that. Yeah. Um, because you don't get to decide what other people tell. Exactly. And if somebody tells you something in common. Why are you even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, continue. No, no, it's fine. Um, I was just going to say, you know, if somebody tells you something in confidence or, you know, you get inducted into a secret society or, you right. know, whatever. Right. Like you don't get you don't get to make the decision exactly. to make that public. Right. Um, you, you don't get the decision to make that to get to make the decision to make that public. That's something that a community is holding in trust together. And mm -hmm. so having respect and trust, you know, and, and establishing yourself as a person of trust makes a big difference in terms of what people want to tell you. But you also have to have respect for the community and there's definitely things that people told me that you know yeah are interesting that i didn't feel the need to write about exactly yeah it was not my business to write about it yeah you know and you have to ask yourself what is the purpose of even sharing the information anyway mm -hmm. you yeah. know, yes. like um especially if the people are not comfortable with it coming out why are you the uh, the person who isn't directly involved in it why do you feel the need to be the one to share it to other people? You know, so, but it can be a challenge too. So, it depends on how you look at it. Yeah, I saw earlier Sechi argue, um, asked a question about, um, you know, the difference between history and below history from below and 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 what um, what like Kwesi um, Kwesi talks about in terms of communography communography, and I I think. Um, can you, sorry. can you explain because this is the, the english that you're using is a bit big right now so yeah 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 explain, like, what, like, what, uh, yeah um. it's a very academic thing but um history from below is like the idea that you um we reconstruct the history uh we reconstruct the past um by looking not at what important people say but at what the average person says Right. And so we collect lots of information about everyday life. We collect oral histories. We collect, you know, all that sort of thing to try to capture everyday life. And that that helps us understand really what's happening at any given moment, way more than what big events are happening or what big people say. Um, and um, so there's uh, Kwesi Kanadu wrote a, a really great book um, that took a, a different sort of approach to um 
to oral history a bit and and t he talked about it as communography and um and it was really like the story and study of a community right and i think that's getting at kind of what Quabin and i both are talking about right that that you know to tell a story it's not just about one person mm -hmm. you, you and them are part of a community yeah and um you know you need to be thinking about that community um as you're doing it and yeah. um i mean there's a lot more in there in terms of what he talks about with that and i encourage you all to read his, his awesome book but um it's uh yeah i mean it's it's just in in that situation right he's telling the story of of a, of a traditional medicine practitioner uh, but that person had made his work public, right? He had released the work. He had um, shared it. And he wasn't just telling the story of that person. He was telling the story of that person within a community that, that he was, he was part of a larger community and he needed to understand that whole community in order to understand that person. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's part of it, right? That it's not just individuals. It's not just like individuals who are separated from each other, right? We're all connected. Exactly. You know, and sometimes it helps to bring an alternative viewpoint to history that can enrich the quote unquote official history that everyone reads. So, for instance, if you ask someone, what's the history of Ghana in the 60s? Or what's the history of the US in the 80s? Or what's the history of the UK in the 90s, right? You'll get a, a lot of facts and figures and stuff about like leaders and public opinion shapers and so on. But what about the ordinary person and how that ordinary person saw what went? You know, and that kind of color that is added to that aspect of history, it helps a lot with how you understand the people in an understand the place, which is why it's important to talk to older people. Like, mm -hmm. like the work that Jennifer did on the drivers, brilliant. The work that Nana is doing with her website, excellent. You know, because you are getting information from all kinds of people, and the it's like little little pieces of a larger puzzle that help you to then get a better understanding of. The people you know which is very important so i see we have some questions coming in if you have questions please if you can use the question function just because i don't want any questions to get lost in the chat but before we go to questions i just wanted just because i want to be mindful of time i know jennifer this jennifer's in the middle of, of her working so. day so <laughs> so we can't we can't hold her for for too too long i, I wanted to touch on like the actual like practical aspects of doing the interview like like is there um like any software or like technology type things that they should like you know people should be aware of what types of interviews like would be the you know would be best to do and at the nano project we videos are our main ones but we also um give the 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 storytellers, as we call them, the uh, opportunity to do an audio interview or a written interview if they don't feel they're not quite comfortable with having their you know face and voice out there. Um, also, if we could talk around issues around consent, because I think this is maybe more so if you're doing public facing work. I think if you're doing if you're just doing an interview with your grandmother, you know, for your own family collection, maybe consent isn't as big of an issue. But if you're going to do something that will be online or be in some type of public archive like how do we handle consent especially if we're dealing with people that may not um have had the chance to receive formal education so because of that they may not be able to um you know read or write in, in any language so so it, it's so what to ask the software technology types of interviews to do um consent and then any other practical uh tips tricks whatever you know things to keep in mind um, when conducting an uh, oral history interview. Yeah, um, uh, just because I, I do have to leave right at three. So I'll, okay. I'll, I'll go first and then, and then we'll, we'll let Quavana go and then we can see what happens. But sure. um, the, um, I think, uh, you know, at this point, frankly, your cell phone is as good and comprehensive a tool as you possibly need, especially for most types of oral history collection, the only, you know, thing, the only reason you would need something more sophisticated is if you were doing a documentary, for example, right? Um, there's very few situations in which you need something more than your phone. Um, the, um, and, and now, frankly, phones are being used to shoot documentaries too. So um, it's, it's also fine. Um, 
you know, I, I do personally think that, um, that video, you know, so my, my early oral histories were collected all on, on audio recording and, and these on a little digital recorder, um, and, and saved as files as MP3s. Um, I, I now do oral histories as much as possible with video, uh, because I know that the oral histories that I recorded via just audio lose something. Um, as I'm remembering them, right, and as other people interact with them, there's things they're not getting by not seeing what's happening around um, around the conversation. There's things that they don't understand because they're not seeing the person um, and their expressions, the expressions on their faces and things. So, um, you know, I think the, the video recordings are really powerful. Um, in terms of consent, um, I think, you know, regardless of the circumstances under which you're collecting an oral history, you always want to ask people for their permission. Um, and you also want to tell people that they don't have to answer anything they don't want to answer and that they can stop at any time. Um, and if you're going to use it for something, you always want to tell people, right, in as clear a way as possible. And um, I think it's helpful to do that in a way that like um, embraces all kinds of possibilities. So when I talked to people about what I was going to do, I explained that I was a student. I explained that their, their stories might appear in books and articles. Um, they might be on the internet, right? Um, and uh, you know, that if, if they wanted to not have their name printed, then I would be happy to use a pseudonym. But most people wanted to be associated with their stories. It's rare that people don't want to have their name attached to their story. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you, um, in my experience, if you explain to people what your purpose is and you show respect, right? So you're showing that you respect them and what they do and who they are, they often want you to tell their story and they want to be associated with it. Um, it, they're, they're only suspicious if they suspect, if they don't trust you, mm. right? Um, people are, are often unwilling to do it if they don't trust you for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, whatever you do, you know, you don't, and, and this is true of researchers as well, right? You don't necessarily have to, um, have people sign a form. You can do oral consent and you need to do that in a way that people are going to understand it. So there might be formal language, but you know, the drivers that I worked with had not finished primary school in many cases. Um, giving them some fancy big English words, <laughs> you know, in legalese that my university Five approved. Five documents to read inside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't gonna work, right? Nah. They didn't know what I was talking yeah. about. So, yeah. you, ha you know, you have to, and same with my grandmother, right? If I had talked to my grandmother that way, um, she wouldn't, she'd be really intimidated, right? And yeah. would, would yeah. shut down. So exactly. you have to, um, you have to talk to people in ways that, that um, meet them where they are and, um, and make sure that they understand why you're there and, and what's going to happen with the story that they tell you. Yeah. No, Corbin, just because, of, do you so, also have to hop up, um, go at the top of the hour? No, 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 no. Okay. All right, just because there's, <laughs> <up. laughs> there's, a, there's a question for Jennifer. Um, it sa says, um, have you had problems with interviewees passing on before you could go back, I guess, to get like secondary information, like if you oh. had to follow up? Um, yes, uh, <laughs> to some degree. Um, I mean, there's always there's always that right um and you don't always get to go back and verify um if that's the case uh, one of the things one of the things that i tell my students all the time is that you should only make arguments about things that you can prove that you feel the evidence supports and if if the evidence that you got if if the information that you got through that interview you don't feel like compellingly support something don't say it right um don't don't claim it um sometimes you can check with other people right you might be able to check with a family member or or you know a ch one of their children or, or one of their brothers or sisters or whatever to to verify the information sometimes you can't and in that case it is what it is right um and you just have to move forward um but but yeah the um you know, the, there are there are limits, right? And so as a historian, I try really, I, I never make an argument that I don't think I can support with evidence, mm -hmm. um, the evidence that's in front of me, right? And that I feel is is reliable and, and um, yeah, 
it, that is reliable. And um, so, so yeah, just, you know, don't, don't argue more than you can, don't argue for more than you can support. Okay. And Jen, uh, Jessica, I think that was the only question that was specific to you. I know you have five minutes academic life. I know you have to run. So if you could just, so Claude, if you have time, you and I, we can continue on um, sure, for a little no bit. Problem. If you have questions, please continue to put them in the chat. Jennifer, where can people find you if they maybe have questions that if they were feeling shy and they weren't, you know, didn't want sure. to ask? today or if they just want to follow your work and learn more about what you're doing how can people get in touch with you how can people find you yeah so i'm on instagram and twitter at detroit to Accra. i'm very um very present there you can tweet at me or send me messages on instagram or twitter um follow me there um, i also have a blog ghana on the go um ghana on the go.com which you can um you can find contact information there email addresses um, you're welcome to email me. Um, I'm happy to help if I can. And um, if you are interested in following along with our new uh, digital humanities project and it's unveiling this summer, you're welcome to, uh, on Facebook, it's Accra Walla, uh, W-A-L-A, like Accra Life. Um, on uh, Twitter and Instagram, it's Accra Mobile. Um, but if you search Accra Walla, it will show up. So, um, you know, follow us on there and stay tuned for um, opportunities to contribute to that new site. And, um, you know, it's another way to, um, you know, we never want to compete with projects like the Nana Project. We want all of us to work together, right? So, like, you can put those things in multiple places because they have different kinds of meaning, right? They can be about family histories. They can be about urban history. They can be about, right? Um, they can be doing different stuff. So, so these are all... Um, these are all like synergies, right? That we can work together and continue to build this arc, like a big archive um, of oral histories that are available to people so that we do have, we can build that library like Quavin was saying earlier. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. We will let you go and continue yeah, the of rest of your, your working you. day. Good to yeah, see you. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I see, just want to shout out um, God's Grace Tedafio, who's in here. She's the Nana Project co-founder. We started it together. Uh, she uh, kindly reminded me that we also do photo stories in addition to the video, audio, and written stories. So there's, you know, people give us photos and then we just put a caption with the photo of what was happening there. Um, that's another way to capture um, you know that you can capture histories. So Kwame, now the, the question for you around the practicalities of um, oral history interviewing so the, the you know any software or technology things you like to use the type of interviews that you have found to be the most helpful and then issues around consent or this just any other you know advice uh, you have i would agree with many of the things that jennifer said um you don't necessarily have to invest financially while doing this if you have a decent smartphone you're good to go you can record via you know audio or video or both or whatever works for you and um, that's the easiest way of capturing information uh, and you have to keep in mind that the context also matters if you are doing it for academic purposes it's different if you are doing it for like let's say a documentary it's also different if you're doing it for a personal reason to or a personal project too it can be different as well but either way you are still going to be using very similar um, software like i don't use anything fancy it's just my phone record and then i'm good to go uh -huh. in terms of consent to again it's also like uh academically they might have those uh irb and all those funny funny things right. well. yeah but typically like regardless of how you are going to do it the person you are you are recording or your interview has to know that uh, you are doing it you don't do anything clandestinely it's not worth it you let them know and you get their explicit consent to do it and if you are going to use it for something outside of a personal use to let them know you know and sometimes you have to compensate them for their time you know uh, it's just how it, it, it works because they're giving you information that you can use to improve yourself like academics use this information to publish and to get promotions some use it to get grant to do research so if you can give them something to compensate their time why not um but that's about it. Like you just have to be very respectful, and you let them know what you are doing. And once they agree, then you are good to go. Wonderful. So let's see. Let's get into some of these questions. If you have questions, please do not feel shy. Please go ahead and 
Yeah. Ideally, put them in the question function because there's, you know, the in the chat, there's quite a bit. Um, so there's a question here about yeah. um, how do you handle challenging topics such as sexual abuse? Hmm. Uh, so it depends. Um, if you are going to, like, if the purpose of the interview is to discuss traumatic topics like that, it's different. But also, mm -hmm. let's say interview and the person just mentions it and you go in there too. There's also a different way of handling that. So it depends. If it's the former, which in other words, like you are going to talk to someone who is, let's say, a survivor of some traumatic experience or whatever, you have to be very careful. You have to understand that that discussion can easily trigger certain uh, reactions. Yes. So mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if you are not equipped for that, you need to get training for it um, because for you, it might just be a project of the person. It might be recalling something that really like mess them up one way or the other. So I would recommend basic training on how to talk to people through these kinds of things. And if, let's say, maybe you're interviewing someone about how life was in the 70s in Ghana, then they talk about how, let's say, the military came and, you know, beat them or did whatever to them and so on and so forth and it just goes there, then you have to um, sort of... Uh, so I also go back to what the person asked in the chat. Like, never react in a way that makes you seem shocked. Like, oh, sir! Oh, wow! Oh, no, like, that is not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Like, And also, don't make jokes out of it. Don't, like, try to be as little as possible. Like, don't make it about you. Try to be as innocuous in the interview as possible and try to make the environment as uh, sort of welcoming for the person as possible to. Uh, you don't create a situation where the person will feel too self-conscious because then they might say things to pander to a certain audience. If you let the person feel at home, as it were, they'll be able to say a lot of things that come across as natural. Then you can get a real story, as it were. But those hard topics... Uh, it's not easy to deal with them, but mm -hmm. try not to make it about you. Don't say, oh, I also had something similar, or like, um, try to let the person speak, and let the person know, like, if they're not comfortable speaking about it, it's fine, and they don't have to speak about it if they don't want to. It's mm -hmm. not about you, yeah. Okay. There's this uh, a similar type of question they're asking, if because of a memory problem, I guess maybe they have a Alzheimer's or dementia or something, they don't want to share part of their story or they might not, you know, again, like what we talked about earlier with them, maybe not being being able to remember everything. How do you interview mm -hmm. someone that has, you know, memory issues or memory loss about their life? Yeah, so if you know for sure that they have those conditions, then you can acknowledge it in your, in your recollection of the interview. You know, you can let them know that you spoke to someone who had these challenges. So that might color how you are going to talk about it or whatever. But if you're also talking to the person and the person is having memory lapses and so on, I think, again, you have to be respectful of the person because ultimately, always remember that the person is giving you their valuable time to tell you things that will benefit you and whoever else is going to be listening to or reading or watching what you are producing out of the interview. So the person is, is doing you a huge favor which you can't pay for because I mean elsewhere people pay top dollar for these kinds of things. So if they have these um, memory lapses and so on, I mean it is what it is. Um, and sometimes they they have very good memories but they just misremember things or they might even lie about things. It happens uh, all the time. <laughs> Part of the end. Again, so I'll, I'll just go back to what I said in the beginning. That doesn't mean that if you read something from a book, it is right. Mm -hmm. Because the book most likely also took it from someone who told them. So mm -hmm. it came from an oral source either way. You know, so you just have to keep that in mind and don't let that necessarily detract from what you find. You find whatever you find and you work with mm -hmm. it. Um, someone has, okay, a question, there's a question's coming in, which is great. Um, someone asked about how much compensation or like, or I guess how much compensation or when do, should you compensate people for their, for their, for their time or for their information? Yeah. So, okay. So I think that is cultural. 
in some cultures, if you give money, they get it. In some cultures, they expect money. You know, so you have to know for sure. And most of the time, it's helpful to let them know that you are doing this and this is the amount that should be given. You know, and sometimes you have to bargain with them. You know, it depends on the nature of the project. And sometimes to uh, you give it, and but most of the time you give it to them after. And you have to make sure that the money you are giving is not influencing them to either say things in a way that they think you want to hear or they will lie or whatever. Because someone might feel, oh, if I am taking this money, I'd better tell a nice story so that it's worth the experience. And the person will just lie and then it throws your project off, you know. So it depends. And as for the amount, it depends. Um, most of the time, especially if you're like a student or you're like a regular person, they're not expecting you to pay a huge amount of money. But the problem I have is with scholars from Western countries who get huge grants to come and do interviews in Ghana and elsewhere and give peanuts. Mm -hmm. They are given budgets and in the budget they have an honorarium for everybody they are going to interview. And instead of giving that said amount, they come and give something small because the person maybe didn't expect it or the person thinks that whatever they are giving is fine. For that one, I'll say whatever has been budgeted, give it to the person regardless mm -hmm. whether it's huge for the person or it's whatever. Even if it's a life-changing, that's what is, is budgeted, you give it to the person. You have to respect that person. And the person will be giving you information that you can use to get a lot of money. You know, Because knowledge is power. Knowledge is actually power in a financial sense and also in a political sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And someone asked, I guess, along those lines, but the eth ethical issues that can come with compensation, which you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned that it could sway how they answer. Are there any other... Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, so there's a long debate about compensation uh, and all of that. Uh, and yes, it can sway, but also not giving can also sway. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've had students who have gone to do interviews and because, you know, these are students from the University of Ghana, they don't have any money. The people will tell them, why should I waste my time talking to you when I can make money elsewhere? You know? mm. Yeah, yeah. So it goes both ways. Uh, and so it can affect the credibility of the interview, but it can affect it positively or negatively. If you are giving money, sometimes it's helpful to the person know that, please don't let this money mean that you save this, this or that. They might take it, they might not take it, but in the end, it's a risk that you are taking either way. You know? And in the end, you have to go in with the assumption that the money you are, or the interview you are giving, is subject to all kinds of uh, parameters that are sometimes out of your control. You know, maybe the person has some bad news that morning and they're going to say something different. Like anything can happen. So you just have to go in with an open mind. And if you can compensate, please do. Uh, people are giving you their time, energy, and perspective and knowledge. And it's a good thing to acknowledge that financially. But if you can't, to let them know. And sometimes people are just happy to talk to you. Like it's just a conversation they're talking, they're just giving it to you. They're happy to just. I mean, there have been some interviews I've had where the person was just happy that, that I was listening. So they went on and on and on and said all kinds of powerful things. Yeah, and they, they didn't, like, you know, nothing about money. You know, they were just be happy to be. And when you give money afterward, they're pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. That's good. And I, so I think this, this is more for, like, academic or, like, I guess, official-type projects. I don't, you know, if you're interviewing someone in your family, you know, um, you know, unless there's some type of, you know, something going on where you feel like you need to pay um, whoever's speaking to you, um, you don't necessarily need to, um, you know, uh, compensate them in that way, unless you feel that it's necessary. Um, yeah, let's see, other questions. Um, okay, when you, when you have, when you have someone you want to interview, how do you prepare and think through all of the things you would like to ask to make the most of their time? That's a good question. That's a good question. Yes. Uh, different kinds of interviews. You can have a structured interview or a semi-structured interview. I mean, uh, but beyond all of that, the first thing you have to understand is the context in which you are entering. Most of the time, in Ghana especially, you have to look, quote-unquote, presentable. Before. I've had students from American universities, for instance, some will dress in all kinds of 
And I mean, I'll tell them, like, this thing you are wearing might not help you get the response you are looking for, you know. Of course, your dress does not necessarily inform how people treat you. But if that's the reality, you just have to be cognizant of the fact that maybe because of what you are wearing, the people might not take you seriously, you know. Or um, in Ghana, again, it's a cultural thing. People do things with their right hand. They don't do things with their left hand. Mm. You know? Or greets before they speak. You don't just go and say, I want this. You go, you greet. How are you? You might ask how the family is. They might give you water. You sit down before you start talking. You don't just go and say, oh, I'm doing this for a project or I really need this for a grade, so talk to me. No, they won't work like that. So sometimes those little things can go a long way. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, sometimes Ghanaians are more open to responding to foreigners than to Ghanaians too, you know. So like there was this guy from Oxford who was doing from, um, research on um, abandoned projects in Ghana over a period of time. And he got information very easily from one of the ministries. And a Ghanaian also based in the UK had been trying for months and hadn't gotten anything. You know, so sometimes the dynamics play out differently. Sometimes if you are female, they will be more difficult with you than if you are male. You know, like it depends on all kinds of factors. And um, I think the best way to prepare is to simply sort of have a fair idea of where you're going. Have sort of an idea, and both you and Jennifer have spoke about this, have a fair idea of what you're going to talk about. Like do basic research at least, get an idea of you know, like the time period, like how things were, maybe something that, some major incident that happened at the time, something. And then before you go, then you start asking questions. And have your questions or have like a set of questions that you can tweak, you know. And if you hear something that is interesting, be prepared to abandon your set of questions and run after that. Yeah, because that can be where the action is. <laughs> before that you didn't prepare for, but the information is so interesting that that could be now the focus of your project so be very adaptable that's well i think for the nana projects one thing that we like to do we have like um it's like a pre-meeting or a pre-call if we can't um you know do the interview in person where we you know we speak with the the person that we'd like to interview and sometimes you know their daughter or you know another relative if they need you know need some support with some things and we just you know let them know you know what it is that we're trying to do and type of information like sometimes we'll have a list of questions kind of pre-prepared depending on how much we know about them and and we'll say like these are the things that we'll, we'll we'll be thinking about asking you just so they can get you know like the one person we've interviewed people who are in their 90s so to ask them what happened right. when they were 10 you know <laughs> is, is is can be can be um it, it can be it's not going to be right in the front of their mind like that so i think if you can mm -hmm. do a little pre-work and, and and take some questions with you or take like i said earlier old <laughs> photographs any mementos to kind of jog their memory uh, and and in that we don't we don't record that like pre-meeting that we have it's really oh. just to make you know just to, to make make connections they get m more familiar with us like like you said you don't just go and just start you know yeah. <laughs> just start yeah. asking questions right away i think yeah. it's good um good for good to make that initial connection so then you know to build trust so they know uh who you are that you're not you don't have some type of ulterior motive um and then to also just kind of get their um get their head going or get their you know their mind thinking mind. and then also if they're with like with another relative i think that's also helpful and i think if you are on this call and you are interested in um interviewing a relative bring your cousin bring your mom you know bring someone yeah. you know <laughs> along with yeah. you because you know um as was said earlier everyone has a different perspective so there might be things that you know your cousin m m will s will think about that you might not necessarily think about so you know take whoever wants to go to that mm -hmm. first meeting or the first phone call or what have you and then you can set up another time depending on the schedule set up another time to to do the actual interview with the recording that's how we that's how we like to to, to operate but that's just one way of operating so like typically do you go with two people or three people it will we're only three on the team so and, and only and two of us are in the uk one is in the u.s so it kind of depends on where okay. we are and that's if it's in person if it's online then yeah. it depends on people's schedule it'll either be um two or three of us depending yeah. on mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, what you said about pictures too was also very important. So a friend of mine called Paul Ninson, he's starting this project where he's building a library, a photo library in Accra or somewhere in Ghana. And it's going to be a lot of photos of different parts of the continent. And it's going to be probably one of the largest photo libraries that we're ever going to have. And mm-hmm. photos are very important in this. A friend of mine has been doing a research on Bano. He's a... Um, yeah, so Bano's work, and she has found very interesting things about how he captured immediate post-independence in Ghana. So photos are actually very important. You, are you should share. We've actually interviewed James Bano a few years ago, if your friend is interested. It's on our, okay. on our website, on our YouTube page. Okay. If she wants to take a look, because he okay. talks about how he got into photography and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So that would be interesting. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, we have some comments here. Someone said, uh, Mustafa is saying, I had a similar experience in interviewing Somali women, and that pre-interview engagement was really important, yes. especially given how Somali people love them, both chatting and talking to others about yeah. really things. Yeah, no, I mean, and it's very important. Again, it is cultural. So when I was a student in the U.S., like, I would get emails from people, and it's always... I need this, or are you doing this, or are you going here? And when I got emails from Ghana, it always was, how are you doing? I hope you are fine. Then they say what they want. <laughs> yeah. So it's a very cultural thing. Um, elsewhere, you just say what you want and go for it. There's no um, pleasantries and stuff like that. Because for them, there's no value in that. But with us, it's a way of establishing a connection. You know, And sometimes that chit-chat you have, is what will open the door for you to get all the information you need. So if you just mm-hmm. went cold like that, you might talk and not get anything. But if you spend those 10 minutes exchanging pleasantries, talking about idle things and so on, you would hear all kinds of very important things. So yeah, so that's a very interesting thing from Somalia. Yeah. yeah. And there's been times where we've done interviews and we've turned off the camera. <laughs> and that's when the story really... <laughs> Exactly. The story really starts to come. Exactly. It's like, where was all of this? Like, just <laughs> even ten minutes ago. Yeah. Then we, you know, sometimes we'll ask if we can turn the camera on and then have them just kind of keep going. Yeah. Or sometimes if they don't feel comfortable, we just hold on to that. You know, for ourselves, and you know, we just and and it's part of the, yeah. you know, we just appreciate them sharing that information mm-hmm. with us. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's beautiful. Are there any uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Please feel free. We'll probably have to wrap up in a bit. Um, I don't see any other. I just see comments. Um, I don't. Let me actually check this question thing again. Um, let's see. Oh, what does it say? What if you are told things that you do not think should? Oh, what if you are told things that you don't think should be shared? Um, so it depends. Usually you can ask them, are you comfortable with me sharing this? And if they are, and you think it will help your project, they have explicitly allowed or agreed for you to do it, then fine. But if you didn't ask and later on, maybe you couldn't ask because the person is out of reach or whatever, and you don't think, like, you should go with your instinct. And you should take ethics over whatever um, benefit you think you might get from the information out. Uh, so if you don't think you should go out, and especially the other person says no, then no, you shouldn't go out. But if you don't think you go out and you have not gotten the other person's perspective, then it's dicey. Um, sometimes people say they, and they don't care. Like they say they don't mind, put it out there, they are fine with it. And that can also be productive. So I would defer to the interviewee's perspective. But if it is absent, then go with your ethics. Okay. That's wonderful. Oh, here comes another question. We will probably finish is in about ten minutes that I'm in the UK. We're both in the same time zone, so we'll say at eight thirty we'll wrap up. So if you have questions, please get them in now. Um, oh, I thought we had a, oh, maybe, am I make, did I make it up? Sorry, the question thing popped up, but it looks like there isn't another one. Okay. Looks like I made that up. That's fine. <laughs> 
Um, I thought I had a question myself, but I've lost it because I saw that notification. Mm. Oh, it's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. Someone wrote a comment. Uh, this is about the um, bringing people with the to you, interviewing more than one person. Uh, reminds me of the old Achimoten. I think she was one of the first women pharmacists in Ghana who invited her best friend from Achimota to join her for an interview. And they does something. They does something else. This actually just remembered um, a friend of mine. Uh, her name is Mabel. Shout out to you, Mabel, if you're on here. Um, she went to Ghana. This is a few years ago, and she took. Oh, the Ghana project. We actually do have um, like a packet of information for people who are interested in um, documenting. This is. Um, Mainly for Ghanaian people, if you're interested in um, uh, 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 archiving a story and sharing it um, with our archive, um, we, we have a set of like, a packet of information for you that you can use on how to do that. And so she actually did that. She went to Ghana and she interviewed both of her grandparents at the same time. Um, and since there was a bit of a, a, a language barrier, she had uh, her, one of her cousins translate uh, her questions and then translate the answers. Um, back to her that and she shared some of the videos with me and that was actually very it was good because what one you know what one grandparent you know didn't remember the other grandparent was able to That's remember cute. so yeah so i think it can work both ways in having um you know maybe you you the interviewer taking a cousin with you and then yeah the interviewee also having another person that you know maybe a sibling or someone very else important. to remember to, yes. to, to to you know help yeah. supplement their information yeah very important and it's also important to differentiate between translation and interpretation mm. right? so translation is simply trying to say whatever you heard um exactly how the person said it but interpretation adds your own framing to what has been said before sometimes someone can, can talk for five minutes and can say oh they said no <laughs> 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 you know, so uh, yeah, it's it's tricky, and when another language comes in, you have to be very careful. Sometimes it's helpful to, and it depends on the depth to which you are doing the interview. Um, it's helpful to get like two different interpreters to mm. to speak to the same thing that was recorded, you know, so that you just make sure that they are like you are getting what is actually what was said you know um but if you can't go that far i mean if you get one person still it's it's enough to you know have something that you can then eventually work with you know but yeah interpretation is something to think about um, versus trans translation excellent so I don't, I don't see any more questions in the chat or anywhere else. So I guess we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, so where, if, where are you online? If people want to um, engage with you and your work, how can they find you? If they were feeling shy, and didn't want to ask you know, <laughs> to ask questions today, how can people contact you? Um, so on Instagram, uh, you probably see me because I'm here right now, but it's Kwabna underscore OA. And the same as Twitter, Facebook, I'm Kwabna Uh My work online, um, I have some articles published. If you go on Google Scholar and you put in my Kwabna Pukwajiman, you find most of them. Some are now coming out, but they will join in in due course. Uh, I'm working on a book, but that will hopefully come out a bit later. And it's on digital humanities in Ghana, uh, digital literature in Ghana. Um, but yeah. Uh, I am not like I used to be very active on social media, but now I've been very busy, especially with kids. So you know, you will find me. Because hopefully, I'll get back that time and you see me disturbing people online a bit more. Okay. So there's actually yeah. So there's actually one one more question before we go officially, uh, and it's a very it's actually a very good question. Um, what if you want to interview a grandparent about their life and they passed? Who should be your next point of contact if you have no other grandparent? Should it be someone older than the grandparent, younger than the grandparent, etc.? Good question. Yes. Uh, and I think you have to make do with your options. Mm -hmm. The children or the grandparent, which, which, which could be your parents or your uncles and aunties. It could be the neighbors in the area. It could be their former schoolmates. It could, like, you have to map out... It's like contact tracing with COVID. You have to map out 
the people whom they had relationships with and see whom you can find and talk to. Because a schoolmate might say very interesting things. Like someone talked things about Kofi Annan in a fancy film. They said he wasn't one of the brightest students in a fancy film, you know. And yet look at where he ended up in life. But if, if you spoke about, I mean, if you found out like how he lived there, it's very interesting. They mm -hmm. actually spoke on Chino Achebe's high school uh, life, you know, and they interviewed his colleagues and his classmates and so on and so forth. So like um, whatever networks that they had in terms of work, in terms of school, in terms of family, you start from there. You can talk to like your parents and hear what they had what were they knew about their grandparents, you know, and then like you build from there. But it would be nice. I mean, it would be nice if people were inspired by the Nana project to talk to their own older relatives and older people in their families and find out about them and then submit it to the Nana project or whatever. Like it'd be nice mm -hmm. if of this, like people just sharing these personal stories from different angles, putting it out there. Then we get to know like life from below, in different decades and so on, all created by the Nana Project. Uh, that would be an exciting thing. Yes, and that's that's part of the reason why we exist. We want people to do that. Yes. <laughs> this is part of the reason why we, we did the IG Live, just to, to give people some ideas on how they can do that. So yes, mm -hmm. we would love for you to share your your um, your stories with us. But before I get into my official, you know, um, uh, spiel about all of that. I did want to say um, to the question, I, I, all my grandparents have passed away. And so what I've done, but you know, thankfully they still have some, um, some siblings that are still living. Of course, my parents, their children and other um, aunts and uncles are still, are still alive. There's people that, that know them, like Kwabana was saying, um, that are still, they're still with us. So I speak to them about like, oh, what did you, what type of, like my grand, my maternal grandfather passed um, before, um, before I was born. And so I talked to my grandmother's sister's husband, so my grandma's brother-in-law, about like what she, what, like what he remembered about my, my grandfather. Uh, you know, just so there's so there's people like a couple of times you have to use the networks that are still that are still on the earth because um, that because that's really all you have. And if there's any again like the photos, the funeral booklets, the any that you can find about them, I think would also be good to that you can you can use to learn about them as well. And it's just, you know it's, it's it's you know morbid, but you know the reality is like our elders. Will only be all of us will only be around for so long, but our elders really will only be around for for so long. So it's important that we speak to them um, yeah. sooner rather than later and get there. Even even if you, we would love for you to share it with us in our archive. And if you are actually interested in that, um, you can send an email to stories at the nanoproject.com or nanoproject.org, stories at the nanoproject.org, or you can send us a message on Instagram which is what we're here right now. We're on um, Twitter at The Nana Project, Facebook at The Nana Project. So you can contact us there. We even have on our website, there's like a, a, a section that will, that shows you if you want to do a more, like a more in-depth interview with a relative, like how to uh, set up a meeting to talk to us about that. Or if you just want to just ask them like a one-off question or send, submit a um, a photo or something, you know, just something small, you can do that as well. So please visit our website, www.thenanaproject.org as well. So we have, all these questions are coming in late, but it's okay, better late than never. Let's see, is this the same one? I don't know why this thing keeps coming up. If you, if you ask the Okay. It keeps saying that there's a how do you say? The notification keeps popping up. I don't see any additional question. Okay. If you have a question, if you have a question that you, you missed, you can send it to us on the DMs. I think I don't think there's anything else. I think it all, all the basics. But yes, we really like we are very passionate about preserving Ghanaian history um, through the voices and stories of our elders. Um, so if you are interested, please you can read this live will be on our. Um, Instagram page. I'll see if I can put up put it up on our YouTube page as well. Um, you know, contact us if you are interested in um, uh, 
collecting a story from someone in your family and sharing it with our archive. And again, please visit our website for more information, www.thenanoproject.org, our social media, or Instagram, Twitter, all of that. Thank you all for coming. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you, Kwabana, Jennifer. I know you've gone already, but we'll thank you again. Thank you for your time. Thank you all for um, for your time, for watching. I really hope that this was helpful. I hope you all feel inspired to even call, you know, go right now, pick up the phone, call your auntie, call your uncle, call your cousin, call your grandma, call your parents, call anyone in <laughs> your in your family, um, just because time really is of, of the essence. Um, not to be more, but that's just that those are just facts. So, so thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Governor, thank you again. Um, Jennifer, thank you again. And uh, that's 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 it for us. Stay tuned. I'm sure we'll have, we have more things coming up in the future. So, can so follow us if you haven't and continue to watch this space. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.